I'm 27 years old, and I've been playing video games for as long as I can remember. Thanks to games like Gran Turismo, Forza, and Midnight Club, I knew the names and specs of hundreds of cars before I ever took my driving test. But how did all those cars get into those games? How did the programmers make them behave like the real thing? And how is it done today? I talked with real life developers at Codemasters, the studio behind racing games like the F1 series, Grid, and the upcoming Dirt 5. Hey guys, how are you guys doing? Oh, Chris is here. I was able to get an inside look at how it all goes down from selecting the cars, modeling them, and making them handle like the real thing. We're gonna cover it all. This video is brought to you by Dirt 5, a game that I'm actually in. In Dirt 5, you can race everything from sprint cars, rally cross, GT, unlimited trucks, buggies, muscle cars, rock bouncers. Codemasters has lined up the ultimate off-road garage. I'm so stoked to try all of them out. There's a career mode with James and I. There's online and four-player couch multiplayer. You can play it with your buddies. And there's a new track editor mode. I think I've owned almost every Dirt game, and I can't wait to play this one with you guys. The game launches on November 6th for Xbox One, PlayStation 4, and PC, with Amplified Edition early access beginning on November 3rd. With Amplified Edition, you get three cars unlocked from the get-go, you get XP and currency boosts, a bunch of other rewards, plus access to every single post-launch addition to Dirt 5, which is great. Not only that, but if you buy Dirt 5 on your current-gen console, like the PS4 and the Xbox One, you get a free upgrade to the next-gen version later this year, which is really awesome. I want to thank Dirt5 and the fine people at Codemasters for making this episode possible and telling me how to build a car in a racing game. Let's get into it. The first consideration a studio needs to make is an obvious one. What kind of game are they making? If they're going for a niche discipline like Kuno's Simulazioni did with Assetto Corsa Competizione, then they only selected current GT3 and GT4 cars. If your studio is calling your game Midnight Club 3 Dub Edition, you better make sure every car in it can be pimped out with huge wheels, underglow, and wild graphics. In Dirt 5's case, Codemasters wanted a wide variety of off-road vehicles, new and old, to appeal to a global audience. I asked them if there's any sort of distinction in the selection process when it came to super serious sim titles versus more laid-back arcade racers, but it sounds like that doesn't really play a role. For me, I, I like playing racing games, and you know, if a sim or an arcade game has those kind of prestige brands, whether that's Porsche or one of the others, I want to drive those cars, whether it's arcade and sim. The cool factor plays a big role as well. Went through each car properly and kind of picked them based on different things, coolness, value mainly, and how, yeah. <laughs> how much fun they would be to drive, right? And if you would really want to own one, then that's something that makes a big difference to having it in our game, I think. That makes sense. No one wants to drive a boring car. So with the preliminary conceptual stuff out of the way, what is the real first step in getting a car into a video game? Well, it usually starts with the vehicle artists. These are the people inside the studio who model and render all the cars in the game. We'll talk about that process later. At Codemasters, the vehicle artists work in tandem with the handling designers to make a list of the cars they want for the game. This list is then sent out to the rest of the studio for feedback. It's like a big company brainstorm to weed out the weaker picks and to pitch new ones. A new list is drafted with all the feedback included. But just because a company feels good about their list doesn't mean that they can start modeling the cars right away. They have to go through the very important step of licensing. A game studio has to buy a license to recreate someone else's design. The manufacturer needs to give their stamp of approval. Knowing this, Codemasters licensing team will then look at the list and let the art team know which cars they'll be able to get for sure. Smaller manufacturers who have never been in a video game before might be more enthusiastic about the process and more willing to help the studio wherever they can. I mean, yeah, your car is going into a video game. That's a pretty big deal. Just think about how many little cars became huge fan favorites because of video games. The Ariel Atom, the little red Suzuki Escudo from Gran Turismo, or all the roof cars that made it into video games because Porsche had an exclusive deal with Electronic Arts. It's pretty standard that no manufacturer allows heavy virtual cabin damage. No company wants to be seen 
as unsafe, but some companies will go further by limiting which liveries and sponsors can be used on their cars because they might not want to be associated with certain brands. Some companies will go even further, limiting which colors can be used on their car as well. We had a manufacturer come back to us recently and they specifically requested us to move a pink, remove a pink color from the livery editor that we have in Dirt 5 because this manufacturer didn't want that color on their car. And you know, that we then have to determine, do we remove that for all vehicles? Or do we just remove it for that manufacturer? I have to imagine that there's probably a legitimate legal reason for a manufacturer not wanting to be painted pink, but it's still pretty funny. So after the licensing team gives the go-ahead for the list of cars the vehicle art team wants, the hands-on work begins. It's now time to get the cars into the game. Back in the 90s, this was a fairly arduous process. A lot of studios would head out to car shows with a camera, a few rolls of film, and a master list of cars they wanted. If they found one of the cars they needed, they'd shoot up to five rolls of film, getting every angle and detail they could think of. Then they'd have to wait a week for the film to be developed and then scan the pictures into a PC, and then they'd trace them with their modeling software. It's a lot of work. The process has changed a lot since then, but the principle is the same. Instead of going out to car shows and hoping to run into the exact car you need, the Codemasters vehicle art team needs to know of a physical example that they can use. The team will then map the car with a handheld 3D scanner with dots placed all over the car. We cover the whole entire car with markers and just go around uh, slowly scanning the entire car with hand. And then once it goes in the computer, then the software will work out everything based on where the dots overlap and stuff, and it'll generate the model. Think of it like a motion capture suit for a car. Now, these scanners are great, but aren't 100% accurate. So the model needs to be smoothed out in the scanner software. An easier route is to get the CAD drawings directly from the manufacturer. These are the same drawings that are used to build the car in real life. So the studio can be certain that they're 100% accurate. Whether or not the car has to be scanned, the vehicle art team still has to trace the 3D models with modeling software like Maya or 3D Max. Advances like 3D scanning were a huge step for racing games. Suddenly, video game developers could get an exact analogous replica of a car instead of a studio's recreation based on photographs and technical drawings. Now that consoles and PCs are so freaking powerful, approaching photorealism, getting detailed down to the micron with a laser does make a difference in how your games look. But sometimes cars are so rare that it's impossible to find a good example to scan, so the vehicle art team has to rely on images like back in the day, except now instead of relying on a film camera, the artists just take to Google instead. All right, so once a car has been modeled, now what? Well, it's time for one of the most important aspects of game design, an unseen factor that arguably does more to convince you a car is real than your eyes do. I'm talking sound. Some games have really good sound, and others don't. In the racing genre, sound is of particular importance. As the consoles have gotten more powerful, visuals aren't the only stimuli that have gotten more impressive. Better processing speed and memory also makes for better sound. The flat engine notes of yesteryear have been replaced with a symphony of multi-sample, layered tracks of audio that accurately represent not only the engine, but the exhaust, differential, straight-cut gears, and tires screeching against the pavement. I remember reading an article in GamePro many years ago about the sound team at Polyphony Digital recording a ton of cars for Gran Turismo 4 and thinking, damn, that's a lot of work for each game. But these days, the process is a little less stressful. Over the years, many studios like Codemasters have amassed their own sound catalogs with a veritable plethora of engine noises. But according to Codemasters senior sound designer Chris Jojo, that doesn't stop his team from going out in the field. If a car is known for having a particularly distinct sound or quirk, they need to record it. Chris will place multiple microphones around the car inside and out, usually in the engine bay and near the exhaust. A newer technique is to also place advanced sound field microphones in the cabin, which do an amazing job with surround sound recording. 
adding these mics to the cabin will give the player enhanced sound when playing from the cockpit view. If you're a purist like me, dude, you got to be in there. You got to see that wheel turning. You got to see the, the dashboard. That's the only way I can accurately get in the zone. Get in the zone. Once the microphones are placed, the car is driven under heavy load and under no load, and then they send it. We record it going driven in anger up and down through the gears. So we're capturing those, those modulations that gear changes, clutch bike, you know, whatever it is. So the car's going as close to the limit as it can or how it's configured. So the idea is to, to capture everything that I can from the car because everything is going to be used. It might sound a little excessive to get this deep into just one aspect of the game, but sound is one of your five senses, and in a medium like gaming, where only three of your senses are being used, it's best to engage all of them the best you can to achieve that immersion. And the audio engineers don't just focus on the car, but how the car interacts with the virtual environment around it. If you're passing, say, barriers going through a tunnel, brick walls, structures like that will have highly reflective properties. Everything like that helps to sell the car, how the player perceives that, and its place within the environment. Maybe it's because I focused on production sound in college, but this stuff is really cool. Okay, so we've modeled our car, we've given it a voice with audio. It looks and sounds like the real thing. So how do we make it feel real? Every studio either uses an existing physics engine like Unreal, Frostbite, or Unity. There's a lot of engines. And some studios, like Codemasters, choose to build their own engine that they can tweak between games. These engines are really complicated, and I'm not smart enough to explain them, but basically, they simulate real-world physics, and the parameters can be modified to every game's individual needs. Arcade racers and sims might seem different on the surface, with arcade racing's more laid-back feel contrasting with the very serious tone of racing simulators, but I was surprised to hear that Codemasters uses the same engine for both types of games. We're running a, a pretty detailed physics simulation under the hood, so whether it's an arcade game or a sim game, there's still quite a similar sim-style model going on underneath. Of course, sims and arcade-style games play very differently, and that's because of what Craig calls helpers. That's um, the little artificial uh, subtle helpers, which will just make the car a bit easier to drive, a bit easier to land on jumps, that sort of thing. Uh, if you collide with another car, we can just help you to all stay going down the track in the right direction. We don't want the player to have a frustrating experience. But what do the programmers actually do with the engine to make cars perform like their real-life counterparts? We basically feed it with, with real-world data. So we can get, say, the mass of the vehicle, um, the air resistance of it, uh, the grip of the tyres, the power, and the torque curve, uh, the gear ratios. For an awful lot of the cars, that's available um, either direct from the manufacturers or just troll the internet and you'll find it. Because these physics engines are becoming so advanced, along with the computers running them, the data that programmers input often result in an output that is the same as the real world performance, which is pretty rad. As you probably know, realism is an important facet of the racing genre. I mean, what's the point of going to all the trouble of getting real cars in your game if they don't drive realistically? But there's an interesting thing about realism. It might not be real at all. What the f <laughs> it's finding the data and getting in and tuning it to feel right. That, that, that's where the skill is, and that's how different games are going to feel different. Obviously, the designers are trying to target a certain feel. A dirt Rally and F1, they're not trying to uh, target an arcade feel. They're trying to target you know, ex extreme accuracy and realism. Or, or at least what people think is real. Because there's yeah. often quite a difference between being realistic and what people perceive as being realistic. And people often want what their perception of realism is as opposed to what's actually real. Whoa. Another kind of prime example of what we've been talking about is um, the ice races. Um, if you're driving on ice with studded tires, the cars in reality would have quite a lot of grip because you get a lot of traction from the, the metal studs digging into the ice. 
That's not necessarily what your average player is going to expect, though. As soon as they see ice, they're expecting to be drifting and sliding the cars all That's over it. the place. So we, we have to come up with this balance where it's still fun and fairly fast, but it's also got that, that slidey character that people are expecting. Mm -hmm. Getting the feel of the game just right is a balancing act between making the cars believable and also having them match the tone of the game. If you're making a super serious sim racer and all your cars are hard to drive, congrats, you're done. But if you're making an arcade style racer, that balance can be a little harder to find. When you hit the mark between fun and realism, that's when you've made a game that everyone can enjoy. I've been playing racing games pretty much my whole life, from Mario Kart on the Super Nintendo to Gran Turismo 2, Midnight Club 3, Burnout, Forza, iRacing, to Dirt Rally 2, and so many games in between. Seeing that progression in real time, seeing the quality of our favorite cars in-game improve so dramatically has frankly been amazing. But after talking to the people on the front line of racing game development, I think we're just getting started. We're definitely at a tipping point now, I think, in the evolution of games consoles and what can be accomplished. Again, I want to thank everyone at Codemasters, Robert, Amrish, Craig, and Chris. They're all great lads, and I learned a lot. Please consider picking up Dirt 5. I'm in the game, James is in the game, and I'm really proud of the work we did. I seriously cannot wait to play this thing with you guys. It's going to be amazing. Be kind. I'll see you next time. <laughs>